Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History. We will be taking on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. And with each episode together, we will peel away the layers to look for the truth. From refer references to the Nephilim, to giant skeletons, to red-haired giants of Lovelock Cave, and many other reports and stories... The theme of giants has persevered down through the ages. So today, we will be looking at some of these amazing reports and stories, legends and myths, to try and discern some truth as to the origins of the giants. Today's going to be an absolutely fascinating topic, so let me bring in my friend and co-host, Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio and Puck the Puck Wedgie. Jimmy, happy Thursday, my friend. <sighs> Yeah, happy Thursday. How you doing? How you doing? I am doing so snazzy. Uh, Puck is rocking his beanie. To, oh my yeah, God, right I just turned on, blue. Right on. Oh, I don't have my beanie. I should be wearing my beanie. I've got I've got a tad bit of a cold. Oh, so I'm going to give uh, everybody the heads up. I've got to work all weekend. I've got stuff to do. Christina has my schedule, but she's not going to divulge it here live on the air. But... Yeah, so uh, I'm taking the night off, and and and, and but uh, there's no way I can bail out of mysteries with the history. Can't do it. Can't do it. I'm not, not going to carry that burden. I'm not going to walk around with that burden. Not gonna do it. Not gonna do it. So anyway, but a uh, great subject today. We can wrap up the show. Uh, we can actually end it right now. I'll just say giants are real. And, and go from there and finish it yeah, off but yeah, they're real they're real there's there's a lot of stories in regards to giants and a lot of which between you and me i wasn't really familiar with i was kind of shocked doing the research for today's show we're going to be covering some really interesting stories some of them which are myths some of them which have tangible evidence and also some hoaxes as well, which is going to be um, really interesting to cover. But there have been countless ancient texts, including the Bible, mention a time when giants walked on earth. There have been multiple civilizations that have written this, written about this in their texts, such as in Greece, including the legends of the um, Aztec, the Egyptians, and even in Irish traditions as well. So this is a, a phenomenon that goes across all cultures across the entire globe. And that right there makes you question, huh, why are all of these countries, all of these different cultures talking about huge humanoids? giants and we're going to get into that but first off terry thank you so much for supporting the channel and the rv fund i do deeply appreciate it starting off the show strong so jimmy i'm going to pass this over to you where do you want to start first for well, today yeah you know that's uh, let's have a little conversation first i'm going to throw something over to you when you hear what what for you what defines a giant that is a great question because for me, a giant is someone that's six foot tall. That is that is super tall to me because I'm only five zero. So I'm like, wow. Um, but on on a uh, you know jokes aside, I think a giant would be classified as someone that exceeds the average. And we see people that are six feet, sometimes seven feet. But like when you're getting to like seven and a half, eight feet, that is where it's getting kind of extreme, where they can't really find clothes as easy as everybody else or shoes and things like this. So I think in my opinion, something that is like a good foot above average would be classified as a giant. And and that's a really good answer, and uh, and I'm going to tell you why. Um, if, if if you go to the distant, you know, because humans have gotten taller and taller and taller over the years, right? Okay, and uh, we're going to continue. Who knows? Maybe in a couple of hundred years, the average height of a human maybe seven feet, right? Right, you know, right now it's kind of cruising around uh, six feet, you know, high fives to six feet. Uh, where I'm at right now. But if you back up um, into the past, not, you don't have to go to the distant past to do this, where the average height was five foot, five, and, and so somebody that was six foot, six and a half foot, or seven, that would be a giant. 
And so, I mean, just humongous, right? And, and if you push it further back, um, the the presence of somebody that was six and a half foot to uh, a culture that is average of five foot, four and a half feet, which is uh, part of history, then that would be a race of giants to them. And But I look at it a little bit differently because if we look at the definition of uh, giantism and 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 how that is, and it's a pretty scary number, by the way, and I'll get to that. Um, for me, I'm picturing something much larger. I'm, I'm picturing something 10 foot, 15 foot, 20 foot tall, um, uh, something that isn't us. You know, big versions of us, six and a half, seven feet tall, or, you know, around it. No, no. When when I think of giants, I'm thinking 30 feet. Right. right. That's that's where I'm at. If we're going to tighten, really, that's what we're getting well, at. If we're going to go into that zone. Right. And there's there is evidence of that. But giantism itself is defined as a condition of excessive growth. Right. Uh, above the average person's height. Um, this condition is caused by overproduction of a growth hormone in uh, during childhood, uh, resulting in uh, people that grow up to nine feet tall. That's that's big, right? Nine feet, nine. Feet. Look, <laughs> that's crazy town uh, to yeah. me. Nine feet tall, um, and gravity is also another issue with this too, as well. Gravity prevents us. You know, it's sucking us down, right? So it prevents us from growing tall. But if you are somebody that's seven feet tall, um, your body is constantly, your heart and your system is constantly working overtime to pump blood through your body when you're up that high. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? And so you have extreme health issues. I know it sounds crazy, man, but when you're that tall, gravity comes in to play, right? And so how does that work with something like dinosaurs or uh, the Nephilim or, you know, giants in the past or, you know, 50-foot dinosaurs and things? Was gravity different? Yeah, that's also possible. And I'm not, I'm not talking crazy talk here. But that's what giantism is. And so giants to one person isn't necessarily a giant to another. And it depends on uh, what culture you're dealing with here on Earth. And for you, you know, for you, um, like Puck right now thinks you're a giant, right? He thinks you're a giant. And then you would think that I'm a giant, right? Do you dig what I'm saying? So what is a giant? I'm going... I'm going big. I'm going to the extreme. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 feet tall. That's pretty impressive. But if you were standing right next to Robert Waldo, uh, Waldlow, excuse me, you would think that he's a giant. And this is the image that we're seeing now. This is Robert. He was 8'11". He was born in 1918. Uh, pretty darn tall to the point where he had to get custom made shoes, custom made clothing, and he is standing right next to his father. And his father was average height, a little under six feet or so. And if I was standing next to Robert, I mean, like, you're an absolute giant. Now, he did have gigantism, which is a growth hormone disorder so you actually never stop growing you just keep keep on going so by the age of eight he was already six feet tall which is yeah it's crazy wild um crazy. but there's a lot of side effects for people that have gigantism and this includes like health defects joint problems heart problems the blood doesn't flow properly across uh, throughout the body so they usually die at a very young age in this case for robert he has so far he is the tallest person um that is that in the world to my knowledge and how tall was he Eight eleven, eight eight feet eleven inches. Yeah, it's crazy. And you know, um, uh, I've I've read about this over the years, and uh, gigantism is usually not all the time, but it's the pituitary gland, and there's tumors or, or something that is causing it to to not shut off. 
which normally shuts off at, you know, at around puberty, you know, you stop, you stop growing at that point. Right. And it just continues to tell your body to grow. And uh, that's great. Can you imagine? I know this sounds weird. What about a bed? You can have custom clothes made, right? But what about a couch? What about all the other stuff that we normally, you know, you go to the furniture store and you you can't, right? Everything doesn't work. Nothing. So dining, imagine driving. Yeah, dining room chair, a car. That's a perfect example. Nothing in your world works. You've got to have everything custom made. But I've often thought about that. A bed, right? You, you check into a hotel. What? What? Oh, we've got some special 10 foot beds for nine foot people. We're going to wheel one of those in. But yeah, it's just like everything is an issue. It's all an issue. Everything's an issue. It so, is. And, and it's very disappointing. And because of this hormonal disorder, he passed away at the age of 22. And he died because he had an infected blister on his foot. Yep. Terrible. Yep, and he let it go. Yeah, yeah. I talked about this on Fade to Black not too long ago. Um, it's a fascinating case. Let's do um, – uh, I know I I didn't answer when you said, where do you want to go first? I want to go – with one of my favorite things. I want to do the giant footprint in South Africa. This one is so cool. And you know what? I wasn't familiar with it. And I'm thinking, how did I not know about this story? It is fascinating. So I'm going to let you take that away while I pull up the image. Um, because there isn't only one in South Africa, but also one in China as well. Yes, there is. There is. And uh, so Michael Tellinger, he comes over from South Africa, comes over to my house and uh, I had a little bit of a shindig, had a party, and Michael and I got to just sit and, and drink and eat and talk about this footprint. And, of course, we did it on Fade to Black uh, a couple of times, too, as well. Um, I am fascinated with this. I don't think that this is some case of pareidolia or uh, it, we're just imagining this. no. That looks to me uh, like a footprint. Now, that's granite, by the way. Okay, that's granite. Um, and it looks like the footprint squished, right? And so what Tellinger had told me, and and I never forgot this, what he said was this, Christina, is that uh, the giant, uh, this was obviously flat on the ground, they were... Um, mining and quarrying stuff and that the granite dust on the ground had mixed with water becomes like a slurry, right? A giant stepped into it. It squished between his toes. It squished up and it just sat there and dried. And then over a couple of hundred thousand years, right? It turns back into granite. And that's 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 Michael's best guess as to how this was created. I I don't dispute that. I think it's a very smart way to interpret how this was done. Um, that you know it's granite now. So to think that something smashed into you know just normal granite and did this, it doesn't make sense. And you also have the squishy areas uh, up on top uh, where it look you've ran around in mud. You know what mud does when you step into it and you do your little your little footprints in it and you turn around. It looks like that. So I see a human footprint. But Robert Schock says, not so fast. And Robert Schock, who we all love and respect, he's a very smart guy and a real rock star. You know, he's a geologist. He says that, it's a natural weathering and erosion feature. Now, he says, uh, when I talked to him about this, he said, man, I, I saw it out of the gate. No, no, this is just natural. I'm like, dude, it's got toes, right? It's got five toes, five toes with stuff squishing. I mean, yeah, but if you look at the entire rock, you will see other 
um, natural erosion features that look like this. Now, this is according to Robert. So when he said that to me, I went back and looked at the rock again, uh, Christina. And although he's right, there's some other stuff going on, by the way, there. But no, they don't look like this. Now, I'm not calling Robert out. I feel that if if I was going to draw a conclusion, I'm leaning more on Tellinger's interpretation here and not Robert's. And uh, now the rock itself, when you see it, um, it's uh, it's in the middle of this field. It's flat and it sticks up. I'm going to say it's probably 50. It's not very big. It's 50 feet across, maybe 20 feet high. And it's just like sticking out of nowhere. So how, how did it get tipped upright, right? It, originally, it was flat. Not so sure, but things like that happen all the time. We have rock formations right out here um, next to my house that are all tilted up. And, and you can see it. It's, it's fantastic uh, to, to look at. And things like this happen all the time in nature, earthquakes and, and what have you. So, um, But I believe that that's a real footprint. But he says, uh, Robert Schock, says that these form um, uh, and and uh, all of them fall into a class of erosional features found often found in rocks known as Tafani. And that in this particular case vaguely resembles, it just happens to look like a human foot imprint. Eh, okay. All right. All right. Robert, you're a smart guy. I, I love you. That looks like a human footprint to me. I don't think that there's any other way to interpret it. Uh, before I uh, flip this over to you, Christina, look at the size of it. It's so what? How big was the giant that did that? So they've done a, a few guesstimates, and uh, they're thinking somewhere between seven to uh, ten meters high or, or taller. So 30 feet, right? 40 feet tall. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Right. So this print right here that we're looking at is about 1.2 meters or about four feet long as, as we can kind of see a reference with the person standing right next to it. So they've estimated that if the footprint is that big and if it was created by a giant and that's if the, that person would be about 24 to 27 feet tall, maybe even to 30 feet. It is kind of hard to say, but that is an estimate. The locals have classified this this print as the footprint of God. That's what the locals call it, which is a really interesting name. Jacob, thank you so much. It says, can you smell what the rock is cooking? No. Thank you so much, Jacob, for supporting the channel. Um, but looking, looking at this, what's really interesting is that it's believed to have been at this print could, was created at any point between 200 million years to 3 billion years ago, which is a, a really big stretch, I think, when it comes to attempting to date something 200 million to 3 billion like that. That's a lot of stretch room for sure i'm okay with this being a footprint um what do you see it it does kind of look like a footprint you're seeing kind this curvature of. that we have with our feet you are seeing these toes as well you're seeing the heel and so if it was created by by nature it'd be like that's pareidolia right there like that is fascinating but it seems like at this point it is a little bit harder to believe more so than stating maybe it's something that can be better explained than just it happened with nature over time uh that's michael tellinger by the way standing in this picture and um i He's a little shorter than I am. I'm going to say Michael's about five foot eight or so. Um, but uh, that that's that's a footprint. I don't think that's a natural erosional feature. Now, could it be that maybe some dinosaurs had human feet? <laughs> could be. Could be. Could it be that? Um, and now everybody go with me. It it could be a giant. Yes. 
Um, but even when you have uh, dogs running around in the snow making footprints and you look, it, it doesn't necessarily look like a dog print because it's distorted and it looks like a, a bird foot or, or, the, or a bird foot looks like a bear foot or whatever. You know, things change when they distort uh, the the mud. So could this be a, a large dinosaur footprint that was misshapen over time? And, and because of the way it pushed into the goo, it, it was misshapen. And it looks to us like a, a human footprint instead of something else. That is also possible. But that is definitely a footprint. Is it from a giant? Or something else? I don't know. I, I simply don't know. But I don't think that's natural erosion at all. No. Uh, but I have to agree with you on that. I think it's a very fascinating story. It's a it's a beautiful image as well. For those listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube so you can see the images that we'll be sharing today. But this one, I think, has to be one of the most profound. But these kinds of prints have been seen across the world across the globe. And another location is in China. And I'm going to share that image. Um, I think if I, I have it. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Let me share this right here because it looks very, very similar on a different, in a different part of the world. Take a look at this. Yes. We are seeing, we're seeing toes. We're seeing, what's that? I don't know what that's called, but like some people kind of have that like protruding area from their uh, foot. Right where their toes meet. It's and called you... a, it's called a thumb. Is it really? What? Well, no, but you know what I'm saying. In a in a uh, in an ape's foot, right? A primate's foot, right? They've got that big toe that sticks out on the side. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. So you're seeing that. You're seeing the heel. You're seeing a little bit of that curvature right there as well, where the um. Look, everybody, everybody said bunion. Ah, thank you. That's that's what I was thinking look, of. Look, bunion, bunion. Thank you, I don't, guys. I don't see. I, don't I appreciate see, that. I don't see bunion, but I'm look. my mind. Everybody just went. Uh, I'm, I'm going Thanks, with a Simple Jack. I'm going with the bun onion. Uh, <laughs> on this one. But yeah, um, uh, I, I agree. Uh, this is how big is this print again? This one right here, this print is two feet long. Yeah. And so that means that with the estimation, the person or giant would have to be at least 13 feet tall. Yeah. Yeah. Two, Which is still a giant. Like that is huge. Two. This is one foot, right? Two feet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a big, that's, that's bigger than Shaq. That's a that's a that's a that's a big footprint. I love this image. I've looked at it so many times over the years. And now, when you look at any of this, um, any geologist, you know, see an impression like this that was made in mud, and it's eventually, you know, petrified, turns into rock, right? So, how old is that footprint? How old is it? It's old, man. It's old. It's old stuff. And this was only found in 2016, so really recent. Yeah, I remember. I remember. Do you really? Was it like on the news? Like, was it written down? Uh, in, in our community, something like this happens. We all know about it. You know, uh, just like I know we're talking about footprints, right? But right before the show today, uh, Biden did his news conference on the UFOs over North America. And uh, it, it, I think, I think the UFO community uh, shared information and knew more about what's going on than the president. I really do. And listening to it, it like this footprint, right? The, this footprint went around quickly, Christina, in our circles. And uh, and right now, the president steps up and says, "Well, you know, we think it's pro the those three we'll move on back and back over to giants but those three ufos uaps and now they're saying that they're private you know companies or you know private uh balloons uh privately owned nobody has stepped forward and said that was our weather balloon project from the university of minnesota whatever right no company has stepped up and said yeah that the one over here was our 
nobody has stepped up. It's really, it's really, really strange to me. Okay, so back to this. Yes, uh, 2016, should this have made the news? Absolutely. Should this have been a bigger deal than it was? Absolutely. You can't, you cannot start changing the dogma, right? You can't uh, start rewriting history because if that footprint is real, and and it dates back before any upright walking anything was happening on this planet, then it changes things. It does. And and that's and that's where the issue lies with this kind of information. And we can get into that uh, rather shortly. But it's kind of when you're presented this information, have it be a hoax or have it be real, that part of side. But it's when people start asking questions, start questioning the history of humanity or questioning our schools and what's taught. That's where it gets very dangerous because as the quote goes, and I say this so often on this on, on my channel or, or anywhere else, it's knowledge is power. And if you don't have knowledge, you don't have power. And in this case, talking about giants or anything unexplained really, if you're not knowledgeable in it, you're not going to ask the questions and you're going to be another person in a cubicle working your nine to five job and just doing what you're told. Now, we need those people to make society run properly. So thank you so much for those that do that. But for the most part, we still need to have that childlike mentality, that imagination, and to ask those questions the way that every four and five-year-old ask, why, 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 why? But they so quickly get shot down by their parents and by teachers and just saying, stop asking questions, just do as you're told and absorb this information and then go play your video games in the corner. And so then we lose that, right. that, 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 that characteristic of asking questions instead we're just we just do as we're told and that's disappointing i got nothing you're right i got nothing i, I have no response to that other than go christina but yeah no it's 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 okay so when we deal with um uh oh my god that's my son why 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 <laughs> and it can be difficult don't get me wrong for those that have kids or have had kids that have hit that age it's very difficult to answer all of their questions of why but they're in this mentality of either one attempting to get your attention but also two really trying to understand the world understand their environment as well so i for those that have kids um it's very important to nurture that aspect of them and to never let them stop asking questions yeah yeah my uh, daughter nicole when she went through that stage um which i loved as a parent i couldn't wait for that to start happening but i gotta tell you it got old after about two three days oh yeah like, i my bet i got why what do you mean why well one day and i'm trying to be the good dad I'm blah, 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 blah. okay but why <sighs> okay but why oh man really are we gonna do this and uh but anyway i loved it it's a great period and once you start uh thinking right and questioning you're two three four years old and you know your brain is in a developmental stage and you are starting to look around and ask questions i loved that part of it for about a week <laughs> all right so um here Okay, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I want. I would like to uh, get into Love Luck. I want to get into the Nephilim. But before we do, I'm gonna give you my uh, two two personal experiences. Why the why this show is important to me. When I was in the fourth grade, I lived in Chicago at that time, and uh, in Chicago, uh, I lived in Waukegan, just a few miles north of Chicago. And in Chicago, they have two of the coolest museums in the world and they have uh, the field museum of natural history and they have uh, the museum of science and industry and i always liked the museum of science and industry better um huge they were built for the world's fair great buildings right um but the field museum and you can look it up of natural history you know, and you walk in, they've got this Tyrannosaurus Rex or whatever, right? You know, just like right there. And it, it, it's cool. It's not my... Anyway, what caught my attention one year as we're going uh, to the field museum on a field trip, but a bump, 
All right. So we're going on a field trip to the field museum. Teacher hands out brochures uh, to the class. We're like going there next week. And I'm looking at the brochure. And on the cover of this brochure was a giant, a skeleton on display. And it caught my attention. And what I remember, this is what I remember, it said something like 14-foot human skeleton, something like that, 12-foot. It was ridiculous. Now, I'm 10 years old, I'm 9 years old. I'm in the fourth grade. And it might have been the fifth grade. Uh, Mrs. Lafferty was fourth grade. I was in, I, this was fifth grade. And I'm looking at it, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. All right, I'm going to, I'm, yeah, I'm into this trip now. Now I'm okay with the Field Museum. I want to go see this giant skeleton. So we go to the Field Museum, no skeleton. And the skeleton that was on the brochure, was it was like in the lobby, like in this big room, you know, you know kind of thing. And I'm walking around, I'm like, uh, where's the, where's the, where's the giant? What are you talking about? Where's the? The giant that's on the brochure, the 14-foot giant. No, well, we don't have one here. And I'm like, man, that's what happened to truth in advertising. Got me all excited. And I have sent now, Christina, I saw this with my own eyes, right? I read the brochure. I saw it. I have gone back uh, on the Internet and tried to find any information with the Field Museum and giant human skeletons. Nothing. Purged. And it was there. It was on the. Uh, it was. It was on the brochure. So what's up with that? And then the other uh, situation that we have here is right off the coast of California. We have Catalina Island, right? Everybody talks about Catalina now because it's it's proximity to the UAPs, right? Pamphlet clickbait. Yeah, I know, right? It was. It was just wrong. So Catalina Island, um, which is owned at the time, uh, not now, but the Wrigley, Wrigley Gum, right? Wrigley's Gum. The Wrigley's owned that island. They built uh, the town of Catalina and the tourist thing. And, and they also, about 100, 150 years ago, uh, they populated the island with buffalo and a couple of other things. Now you can go out to Catalina and there's buffalo there, right? Okay. All of that is cool. But what happened uh, around the turn of the century was they discovered on Catalina giants. So archaeologists descended, uh, anthropologists descended on the island uh, they were d digging up these giant skulls and and remains and and bones, and they had a pretty significant dig site out there on Catalina, and the news got out about this. Now, okay, so this is Jerry right here trying to Jerry trying to jump ahead of my story. He's trying to scoop Jimmy. He's trying to scoop Jimmy here, but Jerry is right. So the story breaks, um, gets into the media. We've got giants discovered on Catalina Island. And the Smithsonian comes in, takes hold of the site, takes the bones, loads them onto, there's a harbor there at Catalina Island, loads the bones onto a ship and splits. The story goes, they dump the bones in the ocean. Yeah. Now, this is, is this urban legend, right? Is this folklore here in Southern California? It's a story that's been going on for, is that the Field Museum? Okay, you're muted. But it sounded good, though, whatever you were saying. This is a picture of one of the museums, one of the Smithsonian museums, because we are going to get into that since you touched on it. So I'm just giving people a visual aid while you continue. Uh, well, actually, but but that's that's the my two little personal things here. One was you know me as a as a young kid, very excited about going to the museum and seeing this giant fourteen foot skeleton uh, on, on the brochure cover, and then coming here to Southern California. This is many years ago, you know, forty years ago, 
And my first trip to Catalina, and I'm taking the ferry over uh, to Catalina, and I get the story about giants on Catalina Island. And this, this, this is not, you can go anywhere in Southern California and hear this story. You know, it's like, it's a big part of Southern California. And that, uh, you know, the, the, how do I say this? The Antichrist, the cabal, the, the, that is the Smithsonian, right? They come in and, and crush something. And we've heard the story repeated over and over, you know, the evil Smithsonian. But apparently that did happen out at uh, Catalina Island. And when it comes to this museum, I came across some very interesting information. And that was back in August of 2015, a U.S. Supreme Court ruling forced the Smithsonian Institute to admit it had been covering up and destroying tens of thousands of giant skeletal remains since the early 1900s. The case against the Smithsonian was made by the American Institution of Alternative Archaeology, or the AIAA, and the irrefutable evidence from came from whistleblowers within the Smithsonian, who admitted to the existence of documents that allegedly proved the destruction of tens of thousands of human skeletons, reaching between 6 feet and 12 feet in height, which a, which is a uh, pretty extreme. So a spokesperson for the AIAA, James Cherward, explained, there has been a major cover-up by Western archaeological institutions since the early 1900s to make us believe that America was first colonized by Asian peoples migrating through the Bering Strait 15,000 years ago, when in fact, there are hundreds of thousands of burial mounds all over America, which the natives claim were there a long time before them, and that shows traces of a highly developed civilization, complex use of metal alloys, and where giant human skeleton remains are frequently found, but still go unreported in the media and news outlets, which is um, very interesting. And a turning point of the court case was when a 1.3 meter long human femur bone was shown as evidence in court of the existence of such human giant bones. The evidence came as a blow to the Smithsonian's lawyers as the bone had been stolen from the Smithsonian by one of their high level curators in the early 1930s who had kept the bone all of his life and which had admitted on which he had admitted on his deathbed in writing stating that he stole the bone, which is yeah, really and, weird. And here's here's the thing um, that I just touched upon. And, and and think about the size of that femur. The femur is your thigh bone, so the strongest bone in your body. Right. right. Okay. But think about something, a femur that big. Yeah, which is four feet. So 1.3 yeah, yeah. meters is four feet. So that, think, that's tall. Think about that for a second. All right. All right. So this this court case, uh, going back to what I brought up about the way that uh, Catalina Island is spoken about here in Southern California, they talk about Catalina Island and the Smithsonian and the way that they came in and grabbed as fact, right? This isn't the story about the guy that escaped the insane asylum with the hook on his hand and the couple dating, right? You know, some crazy story that, that you tell. No, this is, this is fact. This is fact. This is fact. This court case, it's a famous court case. This guy took the bone, stole it, and took it home and lit literally sat on it. Um, but it's a it, it's a four foot femur. Now look down, right? Everybody, look down at your thigh right now. That's your femur, right? And so go knee to hip. It's this big, right? It's that big. That's how big your femur is. I go four times that. Four times. That's how big this femur was. Um, and so yes, um, I I believe when we. You know that uh, that famous uh, scene at the end of Indiana Jones where they're taking the Ark of the Covenant, it's all boxed up, right? And it winds up in a, uh, in a warehouse, right? It's on a forklift, and they take it back to the warehouse, and they lift it up, and it's just put on a shelf and forgotten, right? Well, that's, that's what 
you know, hiding stuff and that's it. It's gone. That's what the Smithsonian has been doing. Yeah. Yeah. Are they evil? Ah, you just can't. You can't change the dogma, Christina. You can't. You can't change it. If you can't there, question. I think that, that that that's the biggest. The biggest thing is that no, it's difficult to change it, but you can't question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's that? So no, no case site. It's bull. Oh man. Uh, not going to get into this. That's one big femur. Yeah, I know. I know. Absolutely. All the goodies are in the warehouse. What was the um and was a television series called was it called The Warehouse? That was pretty good. It was exactly about that subject. Okay, let's go to the Nephilim. What were the Nephilim? Nephilim. Nephilim. Okay, let me share an image here of the most PG one I could find about the Nephilim. So let me pull that up. All right. So we're looking at a huge giant compared to just like people, and we're just going to zoom that out. Okay. So let me get to my notes to give you the accurate description of the Nephilim because we're going all over the place and I'm digging it. But while I look for that, Jimmy, just give us the rundown. Uh, well, the Nephilim, uh, this uh, lifts directly from the Bible, right. uh, specifically the Hebrew Bible. Um, and the Nephilim were just big, giant humans. Uh, the word Nephilim means giants, uh, and and in some translations, uh, in other uh, Hebrew Bibles, it, it is left untranslated, right? But uh, Jewish uh, Jewish explanations interpret them as hybrid sons of fallen angels. Um, but I think in most cases. They were large humans, as depicted in this painting. Right. And you can find the stories about the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, that go into it, that are calling these huge humanoids as giants. Um, and like you had mentioned, from fallen angels who mated with mortal women, creating these entities that we're seeing here and from there when people hear about giants um, throughout history and we'll, we'll cover a few cases the first thing that comes to mind to many is looking at these ancient texts and saying you're seeing a giant that's a nephilim which has also been written about in the mahabharata as well and other ancient texts across all cultures across the globe and i think when we're looking at that, and we could probably jump over to the um, the Cardiff giant in New York, because that right there was a hoax. That that giant story, the the casting of this giant that was found. People, I mean, these guys were selling tickets to see this giant, but it turned out to be a hoax. And from my understanding, it seems as if it was kind of more of like a. Uh, a social experiment that if we were to show this fake looking giant, how would the public react? And for many people that saw this, that ended up writing about this a little bit later or getting interviewed by the newspapers, they're stating this is what has been told to us from the Bible and other ancient texts. So when you bring in that, those opinions, that bias with you, you're going to believe anything. And that's kind of where it's where it's very difficult because we, we're always bringing that with us with any situation any information that we receive anything that we see as well we are bringing in that confirmation bias or bringing in those opinions or bringing in all that past information that we've learned over the years and applying it to whatever we see so when it comes to the nephilim it is really fascinating one person that has done extensive research that we both had on our shows is la marzuli he has done extensive research he's talked about it in depth as well. So for those that are really fascinated um, with the Nephilim and with giants, that is one researcher that I do recommend to look into on that. Well, I, when I, especially, well, actually both versions of the Bible, the Old and New Testament, but 
Um, I'm okay with some some direct interpretations where you're not yeah. really bending, right? That this is not metaphor. This isn't storytelling, you know, to do something. There are times when we just have to sit on it just as it is written. And I do that with the Nephilim and the and the Watchers and and even you know these different angels are not direct. I don't believe angels are directly written about in the Bible. I'm not a biblical scholar of any kind. But here's the thing though, when it comes to the Nephilim, very direct uh naming, uh, uh the descriptions of them, they're not multi-headed monsters. Right or you know you know what I mean a human with ten lion heads and and right. fourteen eyes no 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 so just ginormous humans right and I'm okay with that and I think that they are writing about something that was real and and that that's it and I I think the Nephilim the way that they they are written about in in the Hebrew text is that they were real, just as they were written. Um, there's other parts of the Old Testament where uh, they talk about the years and the sizes, right? The years, the ages. You know, some people living to 700 years, 800 years. Not, do we take that literal? In some cases, I think that we do. I do. Why would they make those kind of mistakes? Well, maybe they weren't mistakes. Uh, the Nephilim, what's the purpose of creating a race of giants, uh, you know, to write about in the Bible like that? I mean, what's the purpose of it? Doesn't make any sense unless they were just real and they wrote about them, right? So I'm I'm okay with that, Christina. I, I really am. It says in Genesis chapter 6 that my spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. And this was referring to the Nephilim. So, yeah, you're right. It's going from, a, you know, a few hundred years um, onward. And that's so when I think of these entities, um, the first thing that comes to mind is Kronos and Zeus, right, from Greek mythology, the sure. Titans. And then that reminds me of the anime titans as well like these like these huge giants just and they're cannibalistic right they're just eating other people and there's a lot of fear in that there's a lot of um i feel like with this with something that's humanoid but it's also so much bigger so much stronger so much faster right that in itself is a horror story for many that is very terrifying but then you can look at the other biblical story of david and goliath where you have a small human which was like average height at the time five 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 and a half feet um going against goliath this huge giant and david was able to win in this story and that in itself, right? The, the moral of the story is giving hope that right. you're able to do anything, even with the very simple tools that you have. In his case, it was just like a, a slingshot. But if we look at that, and let's say we take that incredibly literal, I would be scared. You know that we uh, recently uh, discovered an island in the Philippines of hobbits, right? Okay, so, you know, and you find... I forget what the average height was. It was like three feet, right? Three and a half feet tall. So if your if your culture is three feet, right? Right? Think right. about this, right? right? Three feet. And then we show up. We're a race of giants. Yeah. Right? So if that can happen, why why can't there be another situation? That's all that I'm saying. So what is wrong with that? And and to have to have uh, the Smithsonian uh, time after time after time after time to step in um, and apparently strike this stuff down, just like what happened. It's, this is this is part of the public record, uh, the Grand Canyon. Um, it, we can even look at. Uh, let's jump into uh, the Lovelock Cave. I think that this is a really good example of that, too, as well. Here you have the Lovelock Cave, uh, you know, California. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, 
uh, when was it? Uh, yeah, it was placed in uh, the National Register of Historic Places uh, just in 1984, right? And um, it's uh, it's an incredible situation that we have here, and it's because of the oral history that apply is that that's it right there. Thank you for that. That applies to this, and th that is the the Sai Te Ka or the the Sai Ai are a legendary tribe of red-haired, cannibalistic giants, right? And so you go, and this is oral history, and you go, well, wait a minute. Uh, 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 okay, all right, they're just telling tales. Until they found the remains of a six-foot, six-inch tall, right, skeleton, um, apparently with red hair that had red hair. What, what was that doing in the cave? Well, I'm the asking whole, you, Christina, why, why was that in the cave? <laughs> the whole story actually about how people even found this cave and found the remains is really fascinating. So Lovelock cave is located, um, about it, it's located in Nevada and it's also known as bat cave, horseshoe cave, sunset guano cave and indian cave as well and because of an earthquake the cave's entrance ultimately collapsed leaving it only accessible to bats and then in 1911 that's when people once again found this cave and they're like oh my gosh so much guano which is bat poop and which is a also a really important ingredient for um gunpowder and so over time they were collecting all of this guano and while they were doing that in 1924 that's when archaeologists came in and started doing excavations and finding artifacts and it's said here that a lot of it was either lost or destroyed but more than 10,000 artifacts were successfully recovered two of the successfully recovered artifacts included a male and female mummified red-haired giant the yep. male giant measured about eight feet tall and the female female giant measured about 6.5 feet tall, which is um, pretty fascinating for this time period. And this is kind of, this is like where it gets weird because while archaeologists found these, there is a myth attached to this cave and those what we would classify as giants. So written in 1883, so after it being oral history, it was then officially written down in 1883 by Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, daughter of a Paiute Indian chief. And she goes and she tells this story between the red-haired giants and the Paiutes. And she said that these giants were people eaters and they were very fierce. They could leap up into the air, snatch arrows whizzing over their head and shoot them back at their enemies. The Paiutes named the giants the Sitika, which translates to tool eaters. And the giants yeah. wove yeah. tool, a fibrous water plant into rafts to navigate across what remained of Lake Lahotan, so the story goes. And so the Paiutes told the early settlers that after years of warfare, all of the tribes in the area joined together to rid themselves of these giants. Because once again, these giants were eating eating the tribes. Yeah, eating, eating people, all the people in the tribes. People eaters. Right, which that, I mean, very scary. So... What happened on from there was all of these different tribes, they kind of circle around the giants because their their house, their, their uh, abode, their humble abode was in this cave, Lovelock Cave. So they decided to place a fire inside of that cave and that these giants would die from inhaling all of that smoke with no oxygen. And then those skeletons were left there along with other relics, which were allegedly like super large moccasins, duck decoys made out of a light wood, fishing gear, um, bark sandals as well, even a wooden grasshopper. So again, that part is more on the alleged side. That information is a bit harder to find. But with that, 
if if we take that story at face value, it is a really interesting one. You have this cave in Nevada. You're seeing these huge skeletons for that time period. You're seeing all of these other artifacts. Then you couple it with this native story of the area as well. It's like these are this is very interesting. And from what I've learned speaking to so many other researchers in the field of everything unexplained, it seems that for a lot of people there's a nugget of truth in myths and legends. They all started with something that was true and then from there the story probably took took a life of its own but for the most part and especially for the natives which is really interesting for them is that they have to practice storytelling it is something that's a part of their culture that they need to practice and remember it word for word from what was told to them they're not able to change or alter their story and so if that is true even for this case for this story in particular That means that these giants of Lovelock Cave have been passed down over the centuries and has not been changed. No, that's exactly the point. And so if you have this oral history, this oral tradition um, that has been handed down. Now, the cannibalistic side of it, we have to uh, take a look at that, right? The original uh, warring and wiping out from the Paiute um, and these giants, and they had to get together and, and look, and they're eating our kids. They're eating us. We've, we've got to wipe them out. Uh, the red hairs, uh, the red haired uh, giants, and the way that they were described, all of that is part of the oral history. But when you turn around and you come in with uh, archaeologists and you start to do your research into this cave, and you you recover two skeletons, one that's eight foot tall, one that's six foot six, uh, with red hair, you have to back up and say there's something to this oral tradition. It's not something that has been amplified and twisted out of shape over the years. There's something to it because we can factually back this up. Oh, by the way, um, I saw a photograph of one of the uh, the ducks. Uh, oh, right. yeah, the, the light driftwood I mean, duck decoys? You, it's a pretty good duck. Really? Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good duck. It That's looks awesome. Cool. Um, but yeah, so the oral traditions um, are one thing, but when you turn around and, and back it up like that, no, it's it's pretty incredible. Um, I'm looking at the clock. Um, I'm, I'm surprised I made it through the show. I hey, thought, you're, I, on. you're doing great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought I, everybody, this is what I thought the show was going to be today. It was going to be like this. I was going to be back like this with the microphone. But see, <laughs> but see, Jimmy is passionate about this topic and he, he, he's got to talk about it. Keep, keep going, Christine. Keep going. You're doing good. Just keep going. You're doing good. You're doing good. Keep going. But, but we got to go, we got to do the, uh, the giant of Kandahar. Oh Can my gosh. This one is amazing. Giant of Kandahar. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. And for those did that are read? our regular listeners, we did also cover this for the Mysteries of the Middle East. If you haven't seen that, then you are in for a treat because this story is really, really cool. If you believe it or not, it's a great story. John aside, thank you so much for supporting the channel. He says, how about the giants out of Norse lore? Hashtag ramen wagon. Um, oh, uh, Christina, listen to me. You frozen. Am I frozen now? Speak now. No, now you're not. Okay, now you're not frozen. That was. <laughs> Am I frozen now? Okay, you're unfrozen. Okay, uh, John aside, thank you so much. I read it. Hopefully, you heard me read that. Um, to for today, I don't have any stories in regards to Norse lore, but I know that they do have some pretty wild giant stories. Everybody, we, there's so much to cover everybody, today. Everybody's got a... And there isn't a culture, there isn't a country, there isn't a city, a family. There is... No, everybody's got a story about giants. And That's right. And an hour and a half is just not enough time to cover everything. But let's get into the Kandahar giant. Let me share an image here as a visual aid. Let me pull that up. And, and, we, and, and, and we also got got we we got to go Cardiff the Cardiff hoax too as well. Oh yeah, because we touched on it. We have to cover yeah, we that. We, we have time. We, we have time. We've got to go back. We've got to go back. All right. So Kandahar 
when this when this story broke, um, it's uh, it it made its way pretty quickly into our little conspiracy sewing circles, right? And everybody was talking about it, and uh, there were. Um, the different different radio shows of the time. I'm not going to get into uh, Coast to Coast. I'm not going to get into you know some of the other shows like Coast to Coast that were covering uh, this back then. But this took off. There were two or three stories that happened at the yeah. Look at Christy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was like this was big time. This was big timing it because at that same time we also had the this story and there were some videos floating around of the vamana that was recovered uh from a cave in in afghanistan um there were uh, a time machine was re- a stargate was re- you know all these stories then we had the giant of uh, kandahar um and he was killed uh in 2002 by a group of uh, American army soldiers um, on a mountainside in Kandahar in Afghanistan. They happened in 2002 in a desert part of Afghanistan when a U.S. Army squad allegedly, I'm just going to say allegedly, or I can just say went missing. All right? So in steps the special ops, right? Special, spe- special ops force. Now, because it's Army, is this the Rangers, you know, because the Navy have the SEALs and there's different special operation teams out there. But uh, a task force was sent in uh, to find out what happened, and the soldiers uh, walked along uh, this, this mountain trail until arriving at an entrance to a large cave. Pieces of a broken U.S. military equipment and gear were scattered around the clearing in front of the cave. The task force was about to enter the cave to explore it when, bum, 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 they were attacked by a 15-foot tall, red-headed, by the way, you can see it here in this picture, six-digit, right? You can see on the hand here. Wow, this is all accurate. Look at the feet. Six digits, um, uh, double-toothed, two rows of teeth, a humanoid giant. And now the giant had a spear. He attacked a member of this task force, right? Stabs him. And apparently after he impaled uh, this soldier, the giant uh, started to, or tried to attack the rest of the squad. And apparently, it took 30 seconds, now you can count to 30, 30 seconds of machine gun fire, continuous machine gun fire, uh, to bring down the giant. Between them, the squad was armed with full auto M4 carbines, uh, recon carbines, semi-automatics, and M107 Barrett anti-material rifles. Um, uh, the 50 caliber kind, those are giant, um, this much firepower concentrated on one target for one second, let alone 30 would be extremely destructive. Okay. They did 30 seconds of fire. Now, according to a witness, the giant wore canvas. Isn't that interesting? Right. Like had canvas clothing, some animal hide leather type covering, uh, on its feet, like, you know, shoes. Um, and the moccasins that were made out of this leather supposedly smelled like dead bodies. The creature's body was airlifted back to the squad's base by a helicopter inside of a net. From there, it was loaded onto an aircraft and taken away and was never seen again. Wow. Wow. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, right, right, right. It's yeah, it's many- a really fun story. But my my question here is, it's, I, I think it's so interesting that this giant right here is depicted with red hair. So what is it about giants and red hair, Jimmy? I got nothing. 
They all seem to have red hair. Yeah, it's like you got to be a part of the giant club. You got to have red hair. Yeah, yeah, you're frozen again. That was great. You, you should great. see. You should see the look on your face that it catches you frozen. Oh, I, I bet it's it's that's just lovely. Wrong. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. It was great. It was great. It's awesome. Um, yeah. What is it? Uh, giants and red hair. Did you see uh, American Gods? Did you see that TV? Yes, okay. I I enjoyed season one very much. Dude, the leprechaun, the giant leprechaun. Red also hair. in Halo, by the way. Yeah. Oh, he's great in Halo. Oh, so good. Sorry, man. Sorry, and don't, don't get me forgotten. sideways <laughs> off of that. I loved Halo. I hope they bring it back. I hope there's another. I, I think so. But looking at American Gods, you're right. You have this leprechaun who's actually like super duper tall and he has red hair. But looking at the stories that we've covered so far, there's a handful of them where the giants have red hair. And it's a very interesting characteristic that we're seeing time and time again. Chris says the giants of Scotland have red hair. Well, when it comes to Scotland, I expect nothing less. They need to have red hair. Yeah, what do the giants in Sweden have? It has to be red hair. I mean, I don't uh, expect anything less. It would kick them out. You're only allowed to be blonde. No, red hair. <laughs> but when it when it comes to this story, this is probably one of the most modern public stories that have come out about giants. This took place in 2002. Um, the story supposedly came out in like 2016 or so where it kind of went public where one of the military officials came out with this story telling telling people what happened um which is really really cool but what's so sad about this is that a whole troop was lost to this um uh, to this entity supposedly allegedly and then a second troop came they shot it a Chinook helicopter came, and that's the end of the story. No other information has been that has surfaced uh, when it comes to the information of this Kandahar giant. It's a great story. It I is. mean, everything happened at the same time uh, during that part of it, and um, the cave systems, the age of uh, Afghanistan, so much of it is misunderstood by the West. We've just, you know what I mean? We just don't know. And uh, the we just don't know much about Afghanistan. And it's a country that has just kind of just sat there over the years because, you know, no real natural resources outside of like poppy and, and heroin and the drug trade. But but you, you know what I mean? No, there isn't anything there. Gold, diamonds, uh, petrochemicals, chemicals. Uh, oil, you know, none, none of so therefore, Afghanistan has been kind of ignored uh, throughout history, and and plus it's cold and desolate and, and 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 things, nothing really grows there. So that's that's been the part. Of, so there's always this myth behind it. So when you go and you have something like a stargate discovered in a cave, a vamana, or this giant, the giant of Kandahar. It's a. Uh, it's difficult to access. It's difficult uh, to to get in there, and uh, it's 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 it leaves itself wide open for stories like this. Did it actually happen? Yeah, it's uh, very possible. And and that that's the exciting part about all of this is that all we can really do is speculate. Uh, for the most part, a lot of this um, information is just kind of more alleged aside from the footprints that we have seen in South Africa and China. But those also have a conventional explanation of it happened naturally. Now, you can go from there and decide if you think that's true or not. But for the most part, when we cover these cases and really with anything in regards to mysteries with the history, it's it's. We're looking at it from a more speculative aspect, but also asking those big questions. Did this really happen? What is actually going on? Where are the witnesses? And those questions are very important. But also with any good story, with anything that's catching people's attentions, attention, of course, you're going to have people attempt to make money off of that, off of the suckers, right? Doing some hoaxes. So let's talk about the Cardiff giant in New York. I'm going to share this image here. 
this image back in the early 1900s went viral during that time. Oh, now you've got the family G rated version of this image. Oh, you betcha. Oh uh, yeah. Cause there is, uh, and we're not going to cover that today. So uh, we're not, gonna cover, I mean, fire hydrant. Okay. So this, you know? this image, but, but here's the thing though. Um, uh, no, we're not going to discuss that. But why, if um, if if you are going to hoax this, uh, a petrified, you know, human, why would you go out of your way to to focus on that region of the anatomy? I don't. I, I always found that pretty strange because it was so. Everything else is fuzzy, right? Right. The face, the thing, right? There's no. But that part. Was crystal it, clear. <laughs> yeah, that that is weird. But if you look at a lot of the ancient paintings um, across history, really, that's another consistent theme, where it's that area that's always very detailed compared. Well, actually, a lot of the things were like they're all detailed, but I was also always there as well. So back in 1869, that was not an exception. Of course, they were going to show that as well. But with this mummified giant. It was a fake 10 foot tall mummy made to demonstrate the ludicrousness of blind faith. And it worked. And this was all created by George Hull. And even after he confessed, like, hey, this is fake, people flocked to see this mummy. And still yeah. do. And still do. It's, it, it's still in the, uh, in uh, Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum in Farmington Hills, Michigan, still on display. People are still paying money to go and see it, even though now he's got a cloth around his midriff, um, uh, you know, to cover that. No, for the better. But yeah. this, during that time in 1869, these guys were selling tickets just to see this fake money mummy for 25 cents. Now, I did the math. No, I didn't do the math. Google did the math for me. And that's about like 10 to 12 dollars. And then after two days, because business was booming, everyone wanted to see this. They jumped it over to 50 cents, which is like 20 bucks for a ticket, which yeah. we would pay that today that, that's crazy town wow. and now um this thing 10 foot tall three thousand pounds um and it, they, they, it was described originally as a petrified man and they said that it was uncovered and discovered on October 16th, 1869 by workers digging a well behind the barn of William C. Stubb Newell, Stubb being his nickname, in Cardiff, New York. He covered the giant with a tent and it soon became an attraction site. Both it and an unauthorized copy of it made by P.T. Barnum are still being displayed at P.T. Barnum's uh at Marvis, uh, Mar Marvin's Marvelous Mechanical Museum. The giant was the creation of, of a tobacco farmer. Uh, you just mentioned his name, George Hull, in 1868. Now, it was discovered in 1869. In 1868, Hull, accompanied by a man named H.B. Martin, hired local men to quarry out a 10 foot by four and a half inch thick long block of gypsum in Fort Dodge, Iowa, telling them it was intended for a monument of Abraham Lincoln in New York. Yep. Complete hoax, complete hoax, but people want to believe, you know, and, I remember the first time that I saw the the Cardiff uh, petrified man uh, in, in the upright version, uh, not this one, but when you look, it's like, how would you think that that was ever real? What were, what, what, but people are going to see what they want to see. Yeah, right? church, you, you bring up a really good point. People want to to believe and they will believe whatever they want to and in this case after george hall came out saying this is fake people are like no it's not it's definitely real then you had professors coming in people that supposedly had a nice 
knowledgeable background was like, no, this is very, very real. And it goes to show that people will believe things blindly because we want to believe. We want to have this sense of like, I don't want to say magic, but we we want to believe in things that people would classify as impossible because that gives us more meaning to life. It allows us to look at things and say, okay, this is crazy, but it has to be true. Otherwise, my life is just way too boring, which isn't a bad thing. No, However, it can be dangerous in some aspects or also disappointing. And don't get me wrong. I'm a victim to this as well. There are some things that I'm like, I want this to be true. I want to believe this. And it's not. Yeah, yeah. And that goes with all of us. And then so when, uh, and it's very easy when Hall, right, when George Hall says, no, man, no, 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 it's not real. I made it. Then you have those going, there you go, trying to change the story on us, trying to, this is what they do. They flip the story on us because it's really true, but now they want to flip. And all you're doing when George Hall says something like that is you are cementing their belief. And in this case, no pun intended, but you're cementing, you are strengthening their position. They're not changing their mind. They're not going, oh, okay, it's fake, right? It, 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 okay, all right. No, no, it, it, it solidifies their belief system and it makes it stronger, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon. There's a, actually a medical term for this, right? So if you turn around and it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, dinosaurs are 6,000 years old or we're talking about some religious things or, or, or ghosts or, or anything or a conspiracy theory or um, it, it just doesn't matter. Whatever it, you are not going to, no matter what evidence is presented, no matter what the evidence is, if somebody is is raised a certain way or has a, a belief in something, belief is always a religious connection, right? But if they believe something to be true and you present the facts, it's it, it, it doesn't it makes, matter. It won't no, make a difference. No, it makes it stronger. It makes their belief system stronger. You know, and oh, so there you go. And so that's why it's important to it's in okay, it's important to be an open-minded skeptic. It's okay to have your belief. It's okay to have the things that your your faith and things that you want to believe in, but you also need to remember that your belief and your memory isn't always something that has a good either foundation or that you can always rely on. So I think that it's very mature, but also very courageous for people to say, like, I don't have the information, but I'm open minded to the possibilities. And with and with any information that comes along, that's going to change your perspective and your viewpoint on the topic that you're looking into. And that is what's more important than sticking to what you believe in and not wanting to change because you think it's going to make you look bad in the future when you took back what you said a year or two ago or even right. yesterday we're right. constantly changing we're constantly evolving and this is something that i've learned doing research for only what two years and from where i started to where i am now my idea on so many things my thoughts have changed tremendously but like how like how in in so many aspects for example ufos at some point i really thought it was just nuts and bolts and that's it right. and doing more research that's not the case there's this correlation there's this convergence between the paranormal and ufos looking at the aspect of giants i only heard it in stories or even the very famous story david and goliath and i'm like uh can that can that really be true but doing looking at all of these other things in the previous years until now all i can say is i don't know but i am open-minded to the possibility because we're always receiving more information but this topic the mysterious the unknown is riddled with misinformation and disinformation as well and as my father has always told me history is written by romanticists it's always always written by the the victorious those that had won the battle or the situation so that in itself goes to show that you need to question absolutely everything and there's also two sides to every story you know richard dolan said uh last night on the show that i don't necessarily agree with everything that richard says in fact 
I, I I'm probably halfway. Um, I go I I go into crazy town more than he does, but even Richard is starting to go more crazy town, and it kind of makes me angry because crazy town is my little special area. So I have Richard to ground me. I was talking to Jordan Peace uh, last night and uh, before the show. And and Jordan had said uh, he's one of the. Uh, it doesn't matter. Everybody knows Jordan. Anyway, he he goes, yeah, man, it's going to be. I said I need Richard to center me, to ground me. But when Richard starts going into um, a crazy town, that's not cool to me. <laughs> no, that's this is my area, Richard. This is my fun zone. You're not allowed in here, man. You can you can look in the window. But you're not allowed to come in. So when Richard um, started to say uh, some things about this last night, um, I had to back up and go, "No, I no, Richard, no, I, I I don't agree with this." And and we need that, right? We need to be able to continue what you're saying, Christina. We've got to think. We cannot. Richard's point last night was, "Man, everything out of the government's mouth is a lie." Right, you can't believe any of it. Now there is a, even I, you know, crazy dude. Even I don't go that far, but maybe we, sh you know, do we just absolutely question everything? And if that's the case, if we literally think that everything that is said to it, maybe we do need to have some kind of reset, right? Where our reality is is closer to truth. And and it's not right. Is it really a good thing to just walk around uh, every day of our lives going everything is a lie? You will lose your sanity. Do not yeah, get yeah. me wrong. You yeah. will. So you got to yeah. find that middle ground that's comfortable for you. But Marty, I couldn't have said it better myself. Critical thinking and discernment is key. But unfortunately, that is something that you have to learn over time. We're not born with it well no, you know we should be <laughs> but for the most part we're not or if we're taught in school it's do as you're told your answer is a b c or d pick the right one do not think outside of the box and do not ask questions so it's very difficult to have critical thinking um and to have proper discernment when that is our school system that we have to grow up in until we're 18 and then from there decide if we want to go to university and still be taught that same kind of mentality. Right. So, so I think that when we take a step back and we ask questions, it's very important, but it, it can be hard. It, no one said it was easy. No. And, um, and I think that that is exactly the point. Um, you, you have to, I mean, I've always said, you know, take the news, whatever it is, flip it over 180 degrees. Now you got the truth. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. If you flip it over, you're probably closer to the truth. But is that um, is that a good place to be where you want to believe that you're living a lie? No, I think that there are some good people on this planet, right? And and some good, honest. So, no, I don't think that everything is a lie, but you have to, if you, if you, on any point, I said this to somebody yesterday on the phone talking about some legal issues, right, that are going down. And, uh, and this is what I said, Christina. If you are ever at a point, it doesn't matter. If you're ever at a point where you go, hmm, right, whatever it is, you go, hmm, hmm, that, go with your gut, Right? Go with your gut. Right then. Stop. Right? Just stop. Back up and, and question. If you just, you know, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? You're you're walking through the supermarket. You see this cup, and this cup is on the shelf, and it says 10 for a penny. Right? Yeah, and you question. Go, well, yeah, you go, hmm. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That there's, you know, that hold on, hold on. It's too good to be true. Oh, bless you. Whoo, that was loud. That was real. See, see, that was that was the universe 
saying exactly church that's the point if you if you if you go throughout life and you find yourself your friend is saying something right i thought i was gonna do oh man hold on oh another bless you okay taking a sneeze if your friend is talking i'm gonna sneeze again live uh if your friend is talking and you go hmm it's probably BS, right? Go with your gut. And that goes with anything else. And just, that's it. That's it. That's my advice. That's my advice. It is. No, and it's great advice. Of course, you know, when you're calling BS, do it in a respectful way and be like, you know, I'm not really agreeing with you there because you don't want the situation to get hostile and you don't want to lose a friend just because you don't agree with something that they said. So I think that it's okay to call something that you don't really agree with, but make sure to level the playing ground as well and being like, well, this is what I've learned about the situation, but wherever you got your information, please let me know and I will look into it versus saying you're absolutely wrong, you're dumb, and everything in between, which is uh, terrible, a terrible way to end and start a conversation. I'm trying to get through the show. Oh, we're at we're at the end. We're at the end. We made oh, it through. Man, you've seen that. You saw. You, uh, it's like 20 years ago. It's the Boston Marathon, right? And this guy comes in. He's like in second place, and he's coming up to the finish line. And he's like wiggling, and his knees are shaking. You know. Then he falls down, and he crawls, but he gets his hand over. That's what I just did. <laughs> I just did that. I made it, man. I had a little squiggly there at the end, but I made it. I made it. So there you go. Yeah, uh, seriously. If you go, if you find yourself going, uh, stop. Right? That's all you got to do. Right? You get that. If that hits you, that's your discernment hammer hitting you in the head. Right? Just, Just back up and question. Christina, thank you so much. You're the absolute very best. I'm going to go and sneeze. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you, everybody. Obviously, I'm under the weather. I've got to uh, work all weekend. And uh, so no fade to black today, no breaking news. I am going to uh, relax and prepare uh, for this weekend. So that's it. Everybody have fun. I'll be fine. This is a mild situation. But I got to take care of it now or, right, that's when it turns bad. Christina, behave and be well, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jimmy. What an awesome topic today. Out of all the cases that we covered, out of all the stories that we covered, which one was your favorite? Please let me know in the live chat. Please let me know in the comments. I do read all of the comments as well if you want to continue this conversation that we're having right here right now bring it over to the discord server in the after show chat with over 1300 like-minded members where it's open 24 7 and you can speak to so many amazing people in a safe and friendly environment also take a look at my space ambient music channel called cosmic portals a new track hat was released about a week ago and now i am doing i'm attempting to do a 24 7 format as well for those that want to have some nice restful sleep all across the globe make sure to hit the notification bell on youtube because tomorrow is weekly strange news that is a live stream at 3 p.m pst where i'll be covering all of the strange news and mysterious headlines from around the world you guys really enjoy that show. So if you want to watch it live, hit the notification bell on YouTube so that you do not miss it. And I have everything that we covered. Let me know in the comments. Let me know in the live chat. I want to hear it. I think my favorite one were the footprints because that that evidence was tangible. If it was natural, or if it was created by giants, either way, they're amazing photos. The information, the information is absolutely fantastic as well. And it does make you think outside of the box. It makes you question, huh, could they have been created by giants that were anywhere from 13 feet to 27 feet tall and if that was the case imagine uh, you're just casually walking right enjoying the weather and then you see this ginormous humanoid how would you react what would be what would be going through your mind would you take a picture 
would you attempt to run? Because there's no way you could outrun that thing. Let me just put it out there. So I think that aspect is really interesting and it allows your imagination to run as well. That is it for today. I want to thank everyone watching this live, all the moderators, super uh, chats as well, super stickers, YouTube members, Patreon subscribers. I simply could not do this show without you. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.